You are listening to Action Design, your monthly insight into the field of behavioral economics and its applications to the world around us. We bring you leading practitioners from all industries to discuss cutting-edge behavioral research and how to practically apply those concepts to the development of consumer products and public policy. Uh, thanks again for joining us for another episode of Action Design Radio. We are very excited for this episode. It's been a long time in the making. Um, before I introduce our guest, uh, I'll introduce my co-host as always, Zarak Khan. Hello. Zarak, are you in St. Louis or are you elsewhere today? I am in St. Louis this time. Yeah, we kind of stopped doing Where in the World is Zarak. But, uh, You've been a little yeah. less mobile than you used to be. So um, <laughs> yeah. Over the next couple months, I feel like I'll be the nomad, so... Uh, I'm currently in West Michigan right now, which is an exotic and exciting location. So, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so Zarak and I are very excited to have our guest on today. We have Nir Ayal joining us, uh, a very good friend of the action design communities. Uh, so Nir, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, my pleasure, guys. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're very excited. So uh, you have a new book coming out, which we were very fortunate. Uh, we're recording this in August, and the book is coming out in a few weeks here. Um, we were very fortunate to get the VIP experience and kind of get an early copy of it for this podcast. Um, so Zarak and I have been diving into the book, and we have a bunch of questions for talk about that. Um, but I figured we kind of start with you know a quick introduction to you and your work in the past and currently, um, especially for those who might not be already familiar with uh, what you've done. So just give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself, what you do, what you, your background is, and uh, what you've been working on lately. Absolutely, yeah. So let's see. So I would call myself a behavioral designer, meaning that I use consumer psychology to shape behavior through products as well as helping people shape their own behavior using some of these same principles. Uh, I started out, let's see, my first experience in the industry was uh, I, I helped start two tech companies. Uh, the last one was at the intersection of gaming and advertising, and I had this kind of front row seat during the the rise of Facebook and saw many of these uh, companies kind of come and go over the years. And I had this question in my mind at that point of you know, what makes a habit-forming product? And I had this hypothesis that habits would become increasingly important in the future as the interface shrinks. So as we went from desktop to laptops to mobile devices to wearable devices and now to auditory devices like the Amazon Alexa, the interface has shrunk and disappeared when it comes to a visual interface at least. And so habits become increasingly important because you have to rely upon the user remembering to use your product or you might as well not even exist. So if you're not on the first page of a, of a consumer's phone, if you're not uh, something that they ask Alexa for top of mind, then you, you know you're, you're, you're just your product's not going to be used and you're not going to succeed. So uh, whether it comes to all sorts of industries, uh, many people need to know how to bring consumers back, how to keep consumers engaged. And I, in particular, you know, thought my next company would be something that had to do with with habits, but I I didn't find a book that taught how to build habit forming products. So I did uh, research on the topic. And uh, that research turned into uh, a class at Stanford that I taught for many years, the Graduate School of Business, and then later at the Hassel Plattner Institute of Design. And uh, then Hooked came out in uh, 2014. Uh, and the book, Knock on Wood, I self published it at first, and then it kind of got picked up. And uh, it's been doing great, thankfully. We just passed 250,000 copies. So I'm, I'm thrilled. And it's had a, a, a great impact you know i hear stories daily from from folks who have read the book and applied it to healthcare and um you know apps to help people save money uh, uh kahoot is a company that used uh the hooked model to help create education products actually the largest ed education software in the world they they use the hook model to make uh classroom learning more engaging for kids uh pantry labs is another company that you know, brings uh, changes people's eating habits with these pantries uh, these internet connected pantries that change people's eating habits again they use the hook model so all of these companies use the hooked model to build healthy habits in in people's lives and then so that was the Hooked was published about five years ago, uh, and uh, soon after Hooked was published, uh, I noticed that I was getting maybe unhealthfully hooked to some products and services. And so uh, the turning point for me was when I was sitting with my daughter. We had this afternoon together, and we had this beautiful afternoon set aside for daddy and daughter time. And we had this book 
that uh, we we could uh, flip through and you know kind of prompted us with different activities that daddies and daughters could do together. And one of the activities, I remember the exact wording of this uh, activity, it was, it was a question. And the question was to ask each other, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I remember asking that question, but I don't remember my daughter's answer. Because when she started answering, I was distracted. I was using my phone, checking something, I don't even remember what. That seemed important at the time, but definitely could have waited. And the next thing I knew, I looked up from my phone and my daughter had left the room and uh, she'd found something else to do because she'd gotten the message that she was less important than whatever was on my phone. And if I told you this just happened once, I'd be lying. It happened more times than I'd like to admit. Not only did it happen uh, with people I loved, like my daughter, it also happened at work. You know, I'd sit down to write and I'd uh, just check Slack for one minute or let me just check that quick email or let me just go see what's happening in the news real quick. And I'd constantly get distracted and I couldn't do the, the focused work that I have to do to, 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 to succeed in my career. Uh, it would happen with, with health and fitness, right? I would, I would say, okay, I'm definitely going to eat right. I'm definitely going to go exercise. And I wouldn't do it. And so that's where I realized that this, this, this question is much bigger than just technology. This question is really about why do we get distracted? And boy, wouldn't it be a superpower if we could become indistractable? And so the definition of becoming indistractable is becoming the kind of person who strives to do what they say they're going to do, right? To live with personal integrity. And what, I mean, that's what I wanted, right? The answer to the way I would answer back then would have been, man, if I could just do what it is I say I'm going to do, wow, my life would be completely different. I mean, I, I, I would be in better shape. I would have better relationships. I would, uh, I would get more work done if I simply did what I said I'm going to do. And so that's why I set on this mission now. It's been five years, finally completed and, and publishing this book to become indistractable. And so I really wrote the book for the same reason I wrote Hooked. I was looking for the answer and hopefully other people will find it helpful as well. I'm interested in, in um, so I mean like that, your, your kind of like personal journey I think probably mirrors that of a lot of other people. Um, I've certainly had those same thoughts as well. Um, what has been sort of like the, um, you know, response that you've gotten from other people? Are people kind of saying like, hey, like, yeah, I, I've had the exact same thing. This is what I'm looking for. Are they like, do you get questions about like, hey, like you, you know, your first book is about is about habits and then this one's sort of about breaking uh, unhealthy habits. Um, what's been like the response, your perception of the response um, from kind of like the general populace who's been exposed to these ideas so far? Yeah, yeah. So I can understand how uh, folks who haven't had a chance to read Indistractable might say, this is kind of weird, right? This guy who wrote Hooked is now writing this book about how to get unhooked. And in fact, that was actually what I thought the title of the book would be uh, at first would be unhooked because I was like, oh, oh my God, I opened up this Pandora's box. People are going to use this book for 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 ill. And um, not only did that not happen, <laughs> right? Like the, 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 uh, there aren't companies that I've heard of that are using the hook model for ill. All I've heard is companies using uh, this for good. Um, but you know, I, I still stand behind every word in hooked, and that I I do believe that we can use. Uh, habit-forming technology, by and large, for good. I mean, the the problem at most tech companies uh, is not that people are overusing. Nobody's going to get addicted to SaaS software. Nobody's getting addicted to you know uh, small business software. Nobody's getting addicted to educational software or software that helps you exercise more. That's not a problem, right? The problem out there is that you know these apps. Uh, they don't suck you in, not in the way that you know Facebook and Twitter might suck you in. They just suck, right? Most products out there are just awful, and they're still awful, even despite five years later this book getting out there. And so my goal has always been to make these products less awful because the vast majority of people out there, they want to build products and services that can really improve people's lives if they would just use the product, right? That is the problem that most companies have uh, when it comes to building their, their their devices. So there's nothing wrong with building software to help people exercise more, adhere to their medication, uh, save money. These are great things. And we should use the, the latest advancements uh, in behavioral design and learn from the gaming companies and from the social media companies to use some of these same exact tactics for good. You know, it's interesting. I, I can always tell when someone hasn't read the book uh, when I asked them, you know, did you get to the last chapter? Do you remember what case study I talked about? And they'll kind of stammer and say, oh, it was that gaming company or it was that social network, right? It was Facebook or something. Nope. There's only one case study in the entire book, one chapter devoted to one case study. 
And that case study is of the Bible, or more specifically, the Bible app. And I chose that app very specifically. It's, it's interesting. Um, one of the stories that Bobby Greenwald, the CEO of the Bible app, which, by the way, is one of the most successful apps in history. It has several hundred million users. Nobody ever thinks about it, but it's, it, Bobby Greenwald told me this great story of uh, a user of the Bible app uh, walking into a strip club. And all of a sudden, they got a, a ping on their phone, what I call an external trigger on their phone, from the Bible app. And he gets this notification on his phone, and he says, oh, my God, uh, the Lord is telling me something. And he walks right back out of the, <laughs> of the strip club, <laughs> and it doesn't go in. Uh, it's a and, sign. <laughs> and what do you think about the Bible app? I'd use that app very intentionally. I didn't make the case study about some social network or some gaming company. I made it about the Bible app. Because what you think about the Bible app can tell me a lot about what you think about this particular context of the use of behavioral design and habit formation techniques. If you think that the Bible app is a good thing in the world, that it helps people find meaning and purpose and connects them to something bigger than themselves and helps them become better people, then you think the use of behavioral design and habit formation techniques is wonderful. But if you think that the Bible is divisive and it uh, uh, pulls people apart through ideologies and it's not a good thing, well, then you think these techniques are horrible. And the same, of course, can be said for all of these other technologies. That the answer, you know, I think if there's one thing that plagues our society these days that is a real problem is our binary thinking. Everything's got to be black and white, good guys versus bad guys. And the answers are never that simple. The answer to complex problems is always the same answer. It depends. It depends. Is social media good? It depends. <laughs> is it bad? It depends. You know, if, if you're using social media to connect to people because you're, you know, you're, you have a difficult time finding other people because they live far away from you or you don't have access to them, it's a wonderful outlet. If you overuse it at the uh, cost of being with your family or, or other priorities, then it can be a bad thing. But the, the real cost of these technologies is not that they're somehow melting our brains or hijacking our brains. That's rubbish. That's people, you know, people who say that are in the fear industry complex. They're doing it to, to, to scare you and get, get you to, to pay attention to them. It, ironically, it's the same business model as Facebook, uh, but that's just not the reality. Uh, so what I wanted to do was to have a pro-tech, pro-human approach, because the fact is, you know, every other book on this topic that I read, and I read them all, I read every book I could possibly find on this topic when it comes to distraction, they all basically say the same thing. Just stop using the tech. The tech's melting your brain. Go on a 30-day detox, a 30-day program. And it doesn't freaking work. And the reason it doesn't work is twofold. One, I can't stop. I need these techniques for my livelihood. My job depends on connecting people through email and Slack and Facebook. These tools are my job. Second, you know, they don't work for the same reason that fad diets don't work. So, so I used to be clinically obese. And I no longer am, but I've always struggled with, with my weight and, and uh, uh, you know, food has always been a, a, a problem for me in, in many ways. And I think it's, you know, as a kid, I was clinically obese and I think that's where this fascination with behavioral design started about how products can change our behavior. And I always used to do these fad diets, right? 30 days, no junk food for 30 days. And of course, you know what happened on day 31, right? <laughs> I'd come back with a vengeance and I'd eat more because I'd starve myself. And so abstinence, study after study have shown that abstinence doesn't work. What works is understanding why we do things against our better interest and learning techniques to cope with these, these urges in a healthier fashion. And so that's where I think indistractable is different. I, I go deeper than what I call the proximal causes, right? The proximal cause is the tool. It's the thing we love to blame. It's the big bad tech companies doing it to us. I go deeper than the proximate causes to get to the root cause of why we do things against our better interests. And I think that comes through in a lot of the examples that you use. And in fact, um, as we were kind of preparing for this conversation today, we shared with our producer, Zach Simon, that we were going to be chatting with you, and he's a huge fan of yours. And he actually was an advanced reader for your book, and so I think he was making you know, edits and suggestions and that sort of thing. And so he was intimately familiar with the material already, and he's like, oh, you have to ask him this question. <laughs> and so he pointed out that the fact that you had been making, that you use these examples from history, and in some case from thousands of years ago, um, to highlight the fact that you know, these have been 
uh, challenges for for a long time. So his his question, and that I think it kind of ties in with what you're saying, is were you doing that sort of intentionally to show that these these sort of deeper psychological phenomena have been with us for for a long time? Are you kind of like priming the reader to be thinking uh, in that way, or or were they just sort of like handy examples to uh, to use? No, it's a it's a it's a terrific point. I'm so glad he noticed that because uh, I thought it was really important to provide a historical perspective. I mean, Socrates and Plato talked about the nature of akrasia, this tendency that we have to do things against our better interest, 2,500 years ago. No joke. 2,500 years ago, people were talking about, boy, isn't the world a distracting place these days? Right? So this is not a new phenomenon. I mean, and do we seriously think, let's say tomorrow Zuckerberg says, you know what? You all win. I'm shutting down Facebook. It's terrible. I'm shutting it down. Uh, I'm blacking it out. Do we really think people are going to suddenly not be distracted anymore? No, of course not. We'll go back to doing all the things we used to do. Gossiping, watching sports, uh, reading the National Enquirer, soap operas. Distraction has been around for a very, very long time. If you want to get distracted, you have always found ways to do that. However, that being said, I do think it's important to have a historical perspective, to know that this is not a new problem. And if it's not a new problem, well, then how do we explain so many people in history doing so many great things, right? How, how does that happen? Well, I, I think it happens because these people who have accomplished great things in, in history have done so through the power of focus. They've focused on one thing that was important to them, and that was their contribution to society. The, the other reason I thought it was very important uh, was to transition that into uh, – an application for modern mediums. So yeah, the tools are different. The problem is not different, but maybe we haven't adapted to these tools quick enough uh, to, per to allow us to put these technologies in their place. So I will say that even though distraction is a very, very old problem, if you are susceptible to distraction, if you do not know these techniques, if you are not armed to become indistractable, they're gonna get you. It's easier than ever because technology is so persuasive and pervasive that if you are not prepared, uh, it's very hard. I will acknowledge that, that if you don't know these techniques. The good news is that the antidote for impulsiveness is forethought, right? That if, if, if you're trying to lose weight, but the chocolate cake is on the fork on the way to your mouth, you've lost too late. Right. If if you're sleeping next to your cell phone and you're surprised you check it every morning, it's first thing when you get up, it's too late. Right. You've already lost the battle. And so there is nothing that we there's no impulsiveness that we can't prevent with forethought. Something that our species does better than any other animal on the face of the earth is that we have this gift, this ability to see the future with greater fidelity than any other animal on earth which means that we can plan ahead. And it turns out it's not that hard. And for all the complaining and moaning about the world being so distracted, most of us, myself included, up until I started writing this book, did nothing. <laughs> we didn't take steps to make sure that we do what it is we want to do. And so that's what I want to help with are these techniques that all of us can use to become indistractable. Yeah, I, I just took so many notes on the last like a <laughs> little bit here. But like one thing that jumps out and thinking about the historical is like, we know is kind of behavioral people in the behavioral design behavioral science field that like a lot of like our psychology doesn't really change that much like the things that drive us to take action drive us not like human nature is pretty fixed in a lot of ways but our environments change a lot so the same tactics that distracted us when tv came out and it was a big thing when newspapers were considered distracting like when you know like the ancient philosophers that you write about in there you know it's the same aspects of human nature that were they get distracted or not distracted and focus um but the environment's obviously changed around us um so it's always important i think especially in that behavioral field to think about you know we we know these things about um you know how people think how they make decisions how they decide to f get distracted versus not get distracted for what they work on but the environment's continually change so i think to your point like maybe we just need a new guide uh, there's probably two points to that for one we just need to remind ourselves that you know yeah we do have this new technology but the reasons that we get engaged with that technology are because we're you know the same humans we've always been like technology hasn't created a new thing a new part of our brains that didn't exist but it is kind of you know a different environment for um i want to say 
manipulating or just engaging with those types of decision process. Like it reminds me of when, uh, you know, the last like 10 years, there's been all these articles about millennials are ruining X, like millennials are this. And you can look at like every decade and say, Gen X did this, like the baby boomers did this. And it's always the same complaints over and over. Um, and so it's, it's just funny to think about that, that like, you know, human nature is so fixed, but, you know, we continually think that these are new problems every time we come around. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think what's so ironic with the the current tech lash. And by the way, I I don't want to come off as a tech apologist. Uh, I don't make any money from Facebook or Google. They you know I don't own any shares. I have no vested interest in promoting these companies. I'm not promoting these companies. I want people. You'll see. You know. Oh, well, you saw already in the book. There are many things I tell people to do to cut off these technologies if they're not serving them. Uh, but I I think it's just so funny that we're not realizing that the real distraction is not the tools. The real distraction is thinking it's the tools because that obfuscates the root cause of the problem, particularly when it comes to kids. You know, I was reading the transcripts recently uh, of the Senate hearings around comic books in the 1950s, and it is literally verbatim what people are saying to senators today about social media. It is word for word the same increase in suicide increase in anxiety and depression literally word for word what they're not telling people is that there's a root cause here there's deeper issues going on that if you talk if you actually go out there and talk to healthcare practitioners who are 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 uh, treating children who have overuse disorders or addictions what they told me, as they'll tell anyone, is that 100% of the time, 100% of the time, there's a comorbidity. There's something else going on. And this was the big reveal with these comic book uh, hearings in front of the Senate in the 1950s. You know, these, these doctors, would, you know, people who ran medica- uh, addiction centers that profited from this fear-mongering, basically what was revealed years later that every one of the kids they profiled had an abusive household, had some kind of major trauma in their life, they had some kind of comorbidity with obsessive compulsive disorder, some other comorbidity that wasn't disclosed. But of course, it was all blamed on the comic books. And that's exactly what we're doing today, which prompts this question, what's the deeper issue? Why are our kids overusing? Not only why are they overusing, why are we overusing? And so if we just stick with the surface level analysis, we, we come to these quick conclusions. Yep, it's the technology. That's what's doing it to us. That's the, the source of all our problems, as we always do. We always scapegoat like this. But we never fix the real problem. And so nothing ever changes. Yeah, it's like an interesting point. to like As you were saying, the comic book example, it's like you can almost think of it from the perspective of why do we keep having this problem? Why is every decade there a new technology or something that comes out that is this yeah. problem? So obviously we keep removing things. Um, and to your point too, you know, I, I think it goes kind of both ways. Like we definitely need more, and obviously this is a big topic within behavioral science in general is ethics and how do we, as people who are driving behavior in a lot of ways, there's a lot of responsibility with that. And a lot of, there's a lot of responsibility on people building technology products and especially people building kind of mass, uh, social products and things like that. And there's no doubt that, um, there are things that those companies should be doing better and probably haven't done, um, well in the past in that regard but at the same time like to your point there's kind of this underlying psychology that causes it but it can also s- solve it uh, in a way and that you know we need to empower individual people to be able to take control of their own time rather than either try to get rid of technology or hope that technology solves the problem for us um, right. so in that sense i think that shifts to like kind of what i was thinking is my next question is that sort of a bigger theme that stood out to me in the book was um really preparing people for the shortcomings in their psychology that really prevent them from being able to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wanted to dive into that a little bit and think, you know, what are some examples of those limitations that people have and how should they understand them? How can they um, understand how they work and how can they either work around them or, um, you know, make them work for them in some ways? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first place we start is to stop believing this myth perpetuated by the self-help and uh, personal productivity industry that tells us that if we're not happy, if we're not satisfied, we're not normal. That is not true. That in fact, the human animal, our steady state is dissatisfaction. We are not built to be happy. I mean, think about it from an evolutionary basis. If there was ever a branch of homo sapien that was satisfied, that was hunky-dory, that was happy, 
that tribe was likely killed and eaten by our ancestors, okay? Because there's no evolutionary benefit to satisfaction. We want a species to constantly crave more, to be dissatisfied. Why? Because that's what helps us, you know, create new inventions, life-saving medication, uh, you know, traveling to the stars. All of these things happen because we want more. And that's something we should channel, but we should be aware of. And there is a confluence of these cognitive biases that um, conspire to, to make us perpetually perturbed. And so some of these include uh, negativity bias, right? That we have this tendency to see the bad first. And, you know, I don't need to give you examples. Just, you know, look at the media. This is what keeps the, the news running. It's not about, you know, when you open the newspaper or, or you know, Fox News or MSNBC or, you know, choose your publication. They're not giving you what you need to know. They're giving you what will keep you watching. And, you know, we talk about Facebook being in this business model. This is the exact same business model <laughs> that the media has been in forever. They are all attention merchants. And we love it because we are looking for negativity bias. We're looking for threats. Served us on the savannah, doesn't so much serve us today. Uh, next, you have uh, hedonic adaptation. That even when we get something we strive for, something that's supposed to make us happier, it turns up out that we very quickly adjust to baseline and we're no happier than when we typically started off. Uh, and then, uh, so then we have boredom is another cognitive quirk that we are constantly looking for stimulation. There's a Timothy Wilson study I cite in the book you may be familiar with where they put people in a room uh, with a, a, a band around their arm, uh, nothing to do in this room but to press this button and administer an electrical shock. That's all they could do in this room. And they asked them to sit in this room for 15 minutes and do nothing. And it was something like half of the participants shocked themselves, even though they knew it would be painful, <laughs> right? So it was showing us that we would rather feel something than to feel nothing, that we hate boredom and we constantly seek to escape it. And then finally, rumination. Rumination is this tendency to turn over problems, situations in our head ad nauseum. And this is the source of a lot of problems. If you take a look at uh, chronic pain, uh, uh, if you look at insomnia, uh, it turns out that most insomnia is not, for most people, there are exceptions, but for most people, sleeplessness is actually not caused by something broken in your brain. Uh, it's actually the number one cause of insomnia is worry about insomnia. That is the leading cause of sleeplessness. And so this rumination- I can speak from experience on that one there you myself. Go, right? It's like, it's like <laughs> oh too. man, I was supposed to be asleep 30 minutes ago, it sucks, like what am I gonna do? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So recognizing that these things are normal. I think that's something that needs to be repeated and that we need to live by. Uh, and so instead of somehow, you know, you can sell a lot of books by telling people, here's how to fix this bad feeling forever. The problem is it just ain't true, that if you are not feeling dissatisfaction, you're high, right? You're taking something. You're, part of the human condition is wanting more, and it's fine as long as we channel it in a healthful manner as opposed to a hurtful manner. So as you were thinking through um, like the, the tips and sort of like the um, summaries that you have at the end of each chapter, which I thought were great because they just provide this really concrete actions and steps that people can do. Um, were you sort of thinking like about balancing uh, basically people's need for the sort of quick hit things? Like I can take these actions right now um, as well as sort of the longer term things of like, you know, think about what your goals actually need to be and then plan time accordingly, which is kind of a harder thing to do or a longer term thing to do. So I, I wrote those summary sections in, in the, the book. Uh, because it's a book about distraction. <laughs> and I figured that people reading it would need to get to the point. Uh, so I, 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 I do this uh, for a few reasons. One, I do it because it helps me structure the chapters. And, and more than anything, I appreciate that, right? So the idea is actually that I expect people to go to the end of the chapter, read the quick points, and then if they want more depth onto how I came to those conclusions, they can go back and, and, and do that and read the entire chapter. Of course, they'll get more out of it if they read every word of the chapter, but they don't necessarily have to. Uh, and sometimes you can skip certain chapters. For example, if you get to the section on how to raise indistractable kids, but you don't have any kids, well, you can skip that section if it doesn't apply to you. Uh, but I, I mean, that's I really wrote the book that I would want to read. Uh, and I think, you know, to be totally honest, I hate to be so... Uh, so negative here on, on, on my colleagues and fellow authors, but a lot of business books 
are just full of so much fluff, right? Like if they actually just said the point of each chapter, it'd be like a paragraph, <laughs> right? And a lot of uh, authors don't do this. They don't put the bullet points in the, the back of each chapter, I think because they, you know, they'd have like one bullet point and then people would say like, that's it. That's the whole point of these 30 pages is this one bullet point. You could have just said that. And so I, I really wanted to, you know, make sure that, that I'm giving enough uh, bang for the buck for every page the user reads. There's enough quality content uh, and, and, and uh, as justified by the summary of each and every chapter. Yeah, I saw somebody say it once, like, most books should be blog posts and most blog posts should be tweets. And it's, <laughs> I think, right. a good uh, way of thinking. Like, <laughs> yeah. Don't, yeah. don't make anything any longer than it has to be, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, one thing um, that jumped out at me, and I think we had actually kind of discussed this before, is um, in the book you kind of give an example of uh, ego depletion um, and how that whole kind of concept is really misunderstood by people. And it yeah. ended up that misunderstanding almost caused like a crutch where people are like, oh, my ego is depleted, I'm done for the day, I'm just going to like yeah. play video games or whatever. But that's yeah. not really the case. Like, um, So I think we could, if we could kind of walk through that example and maybe use that example to say, for a lot of these kind of concepts, I feel like they broadly get misunderstood. And then obviously also the research is changing constantly and there's a lot of different ways to interpret these things. But you know, maybe walk through that example and say, you know, use that as a case of how can we kind of better interpret and share a lot of these kind of social psychology research findings so that people can, um, you know, make the best use of those. Sure, sure. So th where this falls into my model is the, the very first step. So the big first step in this model, there are four big steps. The first big step is to master your internal triggers. Uh, these are these uncomfortable sensations, these, uh, th these negative valence states, as they're called in psychology, that we seek to escape from. And it's important to realize that actually these are the motivators for all behavior. That we used to think that behavior is motivated by the desire to pursue pleasure and avoid pain. This is Freud's pleasure principle. But neurologically speaking, that ain't true. That in fact, neurologically speaking, it's pain all the way down. That all human behavior is motivated by a desire to escape discomfort. Even the pursuit of a pleasurable sensation. Even the pursuit of pleasure is motivated by the desire, the wanting, the craving to feel something good. There's a reason we say love hurts, because it does, biologically speaking, it does. So this is all about the homeostatic response. The body gets us to act to make us feel not bad, okay? And so as we talked about earlier, this perpetual disquietude, this constant wanting, is what gets us to do everything we do, har helpful things and harmful things. So if we wanna use these internal triggers, these uncomfortable emotional states, what we have to realize is that if all behavior is motivated by a desire to escape discomfort, well, that means that time management is pain management. Okay, time management is pain management. So how do we manage our pain? How do we manage our discomfort? There's only two things we can do. We can either change the source of the discomfort, fix the problem, or we learn to cope with the discomfort that we cannot change. And so I give several strategies for how do we cope with the discomfort that we can't change, the circumstances in our life that we may not be able to actually, you know, affect change around. And so there are three big strategies here. We can reimagine the trigger, we can reimagine the task, and we can reimagine the te our temperament. So I'm kind of giving you a taxonomy. It's a little bit of like, okay, here's the structure of this section, but let's dive deep now into one of these three techniques to manage and master internal triggers, which is reimagining our temperament. So temperament is defined as this trait, you know, someone's trait that they have, something uh, that they uh, that is inalien in inalienable about them as, as a person. And so what we find is that your self-image of your temperament has a profound impact on your behavior. And one of the demonstrations of, of how this can go awry has to do with this myth of ego depletion. Ego depletion says, this was research done by Roy Beimeister, and Beimeister said in a, in a book that did very, very well when it first came out several years ago, over a decade ago, uh, the book was called Willpower, and in it he claimed that willpower is a finite resource. And, and you've heard this ad nauseum, right? We see this reverberated everywhere. It, it, this has now become a, a piece of folk psychology that, oh, you run out of willpower kind of like you run out of gas in a gas tank. And so I felt this in my life every day. I'd come home from work after a hard day. I felt spent, right? I'd spent my my, uh, my willpower, and I was just unable 
to do anything. Also, what, what what that you know forced me to do now that I had spent all my willpower was to open the fridge, pull out a pint of Ben and, Jer- ben and Jerry's, uh, turn on Netflix, and chill all by myself. Uh, with that pint of, of Ben and Jerry's. That was what I did when I was spent. Now, I didn't know the term ego depletion, but I justified my feeling by saying, by using this word, I was spent, kind of like you spend uh, gas in a gas tank. And so Baumeister claimed that this is this is the case, that you run out of willpower. And in fact, he did these, these crazy experiments where he gave people uh, sugar-sweetened lemonade, and he demonstrated that you could uh, replenish willpower through these sugar-sweetened beverages, claiming that, okay, there must be some kind of interaction in the uh, prefrontal cortex and, you know, something is going on. Turns out other uh, psychologists said this, is, this sounds a little fishy, and they tried to replicate these uh, ego depletion studies, and they couldn't do it. Uh, there's a replication crisis at large in, in the social sciences right now, but this is one of the studies that kind of was one of the first dominoes to fall that, you know, many studies uh, and, and meta studies of those studies found that there is no such thing as ego depletion except for in one group of people. That uh, Carol Dweck at Stanford did these studies and found that one group of people do, in fact, experience ego depletion. Their willpower does, in fact, run out. And those people were people who believed in ego depletion. So what this tells us is that when you believe that you are limited, it becomes so. And this is why it is so important to get real about the effect of distraction on our day-to-day lives. When we buy into this nonsense that technology is addicting us and it's hijacking our brains and these products are making us puppets on a string, we are making it true. It's called learned helplessness. We stop trying. And this is why you hear people talk about technology as an addiction. Whenever you hear somebody talk about technology as an addiction, your bullshit meter should be on 10. Because when you use the word addiction, and and by the way, this is again back to nuance, uh, and how it, you know there, there, there's more here than meets the eye. Some people really do get addicted to all sorts of things. In fact, any analgesic, anything that stops pain, is potentially addictive to someone, but not to everyone, right? We, we many of us drink a glass of wine. We're not uh, alcoholics. Not everybody who has sex is a sex addict. Not everybody who plays poker is a problem gambler. Some people become addicted, but certainly not everyone. Not even close. Single digit percentages of people become addicted. The problem is. When we call these things addicted and we tell everyone that it's addictive and it's hijacking your brain, we believe it just as we believe in ego depletion and we become better or we become worse off for it. Now, watch what happens when I change one word. If I start calling technology something that is addictive versus calling it something that we sometimes overuse, I just disarmed it of all its power over us. And people love calling technology addictive because addiction requires a dealer, a pusher, somebody who's making you do something, a drug that's, you know, turning you into a zombie. But when you call it what it really is, overuse, wait a minute, there's no more pusher anymore. Now it's just me. And that means I might have to do something about it, which sucks. (laughs) So back to your question earlier around why do we keep doing this? Because this is the path of least resistance. The human mind loves paths of least resistance, and the path of least resistance is I can save myself a lot of effort if I blame something or someone else. But that's not the truth. The truth is we have power over this stuff, so we have to change our temperament. Stop telling ourselves these lies, these stories that we perpetuate in our own heads. You know, people tell themselves, oh, I have a short attention span. I have an addictive personality. There's something wrong with me. I must be broken. And look, some people do really have a pathology, but that is not the majority of people, not even close. You know, these pathologies, we're talking about, you know, single digit percentages in the population. The vast majority of us, there's nothing wrong with us. We just need to do these different behaviors change our actions, adopt these new, these new ways of living our lives in order to become indistractable. So it sounds like you're, you're coming down on kind of one side of this, but you wrote Hooked because you had noticed like, oh, this seems like a trend in technology, right? Like as these devices become kind of more a part of our lives, um, habits are going to become really important. And then we you know with, with indistractable, 
maybe there's this other trend and you know you use the word like tech lash right which of course we've all seen people making these claims about like it being addictive um which almost makes it sound like a like a public health thing right here's why i started to ask this question when i uh first got into the role that i'm in now um one of our like it directors asked me like oh like what are what are like the trends that you see um happening out there like do you think like you know the, the technology trends and one of the things that I was thinking of was whenever you go to an old bookstore now, you see all these like cookbooks for like microwaves um, from like the 1950s and 60s. And it's like how to cook everything in the microwave and 50 ways to make meatloaf in the microwave. And part of it is that that was sort of like um, like where technology was at the time. But then people kind of moved on and now sort of like the bigger trends are things like, you know, farm to table and local and organic and all of that. And so – when he and I were chatting about this, I remember thinking this might be kind of like a, a trend for folks where, you know, you're moving away from technology and it doesn't necessarily address the sort of like deeper psychological motivators that, that are kind of prompting this distraction. But I, I wasn't sure if you also kind of were seeing the sort of like trend towards towards this where, you know, people are going to be trying to eschew these technologies and, you know, try to 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 disconnect in some way if that's kind of what was like prompting your your thinking about this in addition to like your personal experience yeah i think that uh you know not using these technologies is great i I want people to question their relationship and their use of technology i don't think we need to vilify them we don't need to believe that it's hijacking our brains which is not uh to moderate our use the idea here is to ask ourselves whether these tools are serving us or whether we're serving them. And and so we can think of it, I think of it as this um, dichotomy that p- perhaps deserves explanation. You know, when we use this term distraction, I, I should have defined it earlier. You know, what, what do we exactly mean by distraction? Distraction, the opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. They both come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And they both end in the same word, A-C-T-I-O-N, action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want, things that you do with intent. The opposite of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you want to do, anything that you did without intent. Now, distraction is always bad. By the way, distraction is not the same thing as diversion. Diversion is when you let your attention go somewhere else, but it can be done with intent. If you want to zone out watching a movie, great. If you want to meditate, great. If you want to take a walk and just space out, wonderful. Do it, but do it with intent. Similarly, if you want to watch YouTube videos, if you want to putz around on Facebook, if you want to watch a football game, wonderful. Do it. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you do it on your schedule and not because of someone else's schedule, like an app maker or a boss, or your kids, or your spouse, do things because you do them with intent. And and so if if what I want to do is to stop vilifying, you know this 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 moral you know hierarchy of oh Candy Crush is somehow morally inferior to watching football on TV. Why? They're both pastimes. There's nothing wrong with them if we use them on our schedule. So we have to get away from this idea that they're melting our brains and all this this silliness that, that's been perpetuated, that's simply not helpful because it gives these products more power and more control because of what we talked about earlier than they deserve. So I'm not advocating, I don't frankly care what you do with your time. As long as it's consistent with your values, that's what I want you to do. The problem is that so many of us go through our day-to-day lives without turning our values into time. We just kind of float around and we think, you know, we, we, today we blame our technology, but it turns out in my research, the source of our distraction goes much, much deeper than that, right? The number one source of distraction are these internal triggers, these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape from. And so even if you put away the technology, as I did, right, I got a, a flip phone on Alibaba for $12 and I got this uh, word processor on eBay from the 1990s and I got rid of all my internet connections and I still got distracted. Why? because I got this bookshelf behind me with all these interesting books and my desk was dirty, so that needed tidying. And let me just take out the trash real quick. I kept looking for distraction because I hadn't figured out these techniques to cope with why I was looking for distraction in the first place. And so that's a much more 
important thing for us to tackle first and foremost. But of course, that's just step one. You know, step one is is mastering internal triggers. Step two is to make time for traction. Step three is to hack back these external triggers to you know to 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 fight back with all of these techniques uh, that are used to get us to keep checking our devices. We have way more power than these technologies ever did and ever will, again, because the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. We can take steps today to make sure we don't get distracted tomorrow. And step four is to prevent distraction with pacts. That we can make, we can use what's called a pre-commitment device to make sure that when we are likely to get distracted, we don't get distracted. We keep ourselves focused. And ironically, many of the tools we can use to make these pre-commitments and pacts our technologies, <laughs> right? Our many free technologies out there, which I highlight in the book, that can help us stay on task by making sure that we we commit to doing what we say we're going to do. Yeah, I think it's a really good point to keep like reading and remember is that like any particular thing can be good or bad for us. Like I really liked the example in the book you gave um, of the person who got addicted to like the pedometer, like tracking their steps. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, in general, that's like a good thing. You think like, hey, it is build a product, like help people walk more, like what could go wrong with that? But this person got literally addicted to it and was like staying up late at night, like trying to get more steps in. But then the example you give, like a lot of it was like, there was a lot of things going on in their lives and that was just kind of an escape from it. Um, So I think it's like, again, it's like nuance is always a challenge, but like I've definitely known people that get, I would say, you know, addicted isn't sort of the right word, but they go to the gym for like two or three hours a day and yeah. like they're obviously just like escaping at that point. It's like you're not right. really getting in that much better shape. Um, there's anything that's exactly that make right. it bad for us. And I think getting that intention, like you know, we think about kind of these. Um, you, you know, maybe part of what's challenging is that we're still in such a new era of having a lot of these products where we're not totally sure how they align with our values all the time. Uh, like there's no doubt. Like I think we take for granted how I, easy it is to stay in touch with people now with Facebook, for example. Um, but, um, you know, I think some of it's like we all got to figure out that personal side of what's valuable for us. Like Twitter's an example. I know for me, like Twitter's probably the thing I get addicted to the most, I would say. Again, not to use addictive, but I, I definitely probably waste overuse, the natu- overuse. naturally waste the most time overuse. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it can get very you, it's really easy to get caught up in the day to day controversies and things like that. So I actually like took time. And this is before I read the book. I'm proud of myself that I thought about this a little bit ahead of time. Um, but like uh, I, I took the time to like preen my feed and like make a bunch of lists of people I'm lists that I could access where I can get away from like the algorithm and like it maybe giving me stuff that will just distract me. And how do I just get, because I do find a lot of valuable information on there. Like I follow researchers that share really interesting stuff, um, like entrepreneurs that are very like inspiring. Um, there's a lot of like interesting information on there, but I just had to curate my feed better so that when I got on there, I was getting that and not going down a rabbit hole of people having some sort of controversy or like memes or whatever that is. Um, so I think it's just like a point that's worth reiterating. Like all these things have their good and bad sides and we have to kind of figure out which things are good for us and which are bad and sort to be intentional about how we use those. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with using Twitter. The the I think where where I tr- messed up before I realized this methodology this four part process that we can use to become indistractable. Uh one I didn't understand my internal triggers. Uh I wasn't honest with myself that look the reason I was checking my device when I wanted to be with my daughter had nothing to do with my device. <laughs> it was that I was looking for escape. Right when I was Googling something or checking email for a minute, when I wanted to work and and do my writing, which is hard work, I was escaping the hard work. Right, it it, it felt bad. I was anxious. I was nervous. Would anybody like it? This is hard. I'm bored. That's why we keep using these devices. Those are the internal triggers. And if we don't learn to master those, we'll always get distracted by something. And then step two is to make time for traction. So on my schedule, it says time for social media. There's literally a block of time every day. When I can check Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, I can do all that, right, at a certain time of day, not on the app maker's schedule, on my schedule. And if I block out time with, uh, for it, I turn what used to be a distraction, something I would use to, to pacify emotions I didn't know how to deal with, like boredom, anxiety, uncertainty, fatigue, into, for that used to be a distraction, into traction, 
That's exactly what I want to do with my time. At that time in my calendar, I want to be on social media. That's what I planned to do with my time. And there's nothing wrong with it. So it's really about doing it with intent on your schedule as opposed to uh, the app maker schedule. Out of curiosity, do you block out all the time on your calendar? Yes. So that's that's the crucial step too. Make time for traction. Turn your values into time. So this is using the time boxing techniques. And so the reason this is so important uh, is that you cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So you know, I, 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 in the book, I have this case study of this friend of mine who said, oh, you wrote Hooked, and now look at me. I'm constantly distracted, right? Everything distracts me. I've, I, I can't get anything done. My, uh, uh, you know, my kids want this. My boss wants this. This is what happened on Twitter. Trump said that. I can't get anything done. And I said, wow, that's, that's really tough. You know, can, can I see your schedule? Can I see what it was that you planned to do today that you got distracted from? And she kind of sheepishly looks at me. She looks at her phone. She opens it up. She takes out her, you know, she, she uh, taps on her calendar app. And it's blank. <laughs> There's nothing on it. So you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. If your calendar is blank, if it has open time on it, are you surprised you got distracted? What did you want to do with that time? So you have to plan your day or someone else will. That's just the modern world we live in. You know, we don't have to kill our food anymore. We don't have to plant our own crops. Uh, we can talk to each other from thousands of miles away for free. The cost of the modern world, sorry, you got to plan your day. You got to turn off notifications. You got to use these techniques to become indistractable. That's the price of progress. I loved how many things I saw in the book that we had talked about uh, just over the years. And uh -huh. I was like, just from our conversations, it's like, oh, I've been using that ever since I talked to Nir about it. Uh <laughs> I also use the um, the uh, timer on my router. Nice, uh, to, like, nice. Turn off the internet. Um, and yeah, then that, that saved my sex life, you know. Yeah, I was about to say, I, I you know, if uh, without revealing any of the um, too much of the content, there is a chapter that's called "How to Be an Indistractable Lover," which I think is reason enough to. to <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah um, that's exactly right. I mean, we we you know we've been married for almost twenty years now, and so I'm just I'm just happy I have a sex life after twenty years. But we have a fantastic relationship, <laughs> and the, the the problem was that we kept getting distracted. Right, we wanted to be intimate with each other, but every night. We found ourselves fondling our iPads and our iPhones as opposed to being intimate. And so we did exactly what, what you said. We, we got this outlet timer. This is step four, actually. Step four is about preventing distraction with pacts. And we made this pre-commitment. Again, the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. So we thought ahead and we said, okay, we want to be in bed at 10 o'clock to have some time together, to make sure we get enough sleep, 10 o'clock. So every night in our household, the internet shuts off at 10 o'clock every night and everybody knows it now we actually don't use an internet timer anymore uh, or an outlet timer we actually have an uh, a router called the Eero router that has this functionality built in so you can program it for certain devices to turn off at certain times and it's awesome it's wonderful because everybody knows 10 o'clock you know hurry up get to bed because the internet router is going to shut off so do everything you need to do and it's it's a wonderful pre-commitment device and you know what that that uh, outlet timer cost us five bucks great value <laughs> yeah exactly but no it, I, li I like yeah i like that example and just generally like the the chapter on like using this relationship because i think um i think it's easy to identify with this stuff when it comes to work like i think all of us are getting emails all the time and like it's easy to say that but i think sometimes i think when we think of our personal lives and especially in our personal relationships there's almost this sort of like stigma with some of these where it's like that should come naturally. It's like, oh, like, uh, you know, you shouldn't need to plan a, and structure around these types of things in your relationship as much because there's just this thought that that shouldn't take as much work and it almost feels, I, I think a lot of people feel bad thinking of it that way, but in a lot of ways you almost have to be even more intentional and more structured with your kind of personal relationships because a lot of times those are the easiest things that go to the wayside. That's so true. And I think the reason why that's happened, it's not a coincidence. I think, you know, first of all, we are suffering through a loneliness epidemic in this country. I mean, psychologists tell us that loneliness is more detrimental to our health than smoking and obesity. It is a nationwide epidemic of loneliness. And it's no coincidence. I mean, this correlates with the rise of secularism in this country. The, the largest denomination in this country, uh, religious affiliation, that is, is nuns, right? People who don't have any religious affiliation. I, I'm one of them. Uh, but the cost of that is that we don't have the place on our calendars to connect with people in our community, to connect with our friends. This used to be what people did every Sunday or Saturday, depending on your, your religion, your faith. You would regularly meet up with people. 
Well, as the countries become more secular, there are fewer and fewer of these institutions. And this is a long time coming. Um, uh, um, th there was this book, Bowling Alone, that was in the 1990s that talked about, Robert Putnam, I think, was the author, who talked about this trend and uh, the decline of, of civil society, of you know the Rotary Club and Kiwanis and uh, church groups. The, the fall uh, or the, the decline of, of patronage of these groups has also led to this this loneliness epidemic. Well, why? It's because we don't have a time in our calendar set aside for our friends. Now, I'm not saying you need to attend a religious group. Uh, we can do this in a secular fashion, right? What do we do? Well, I, I detail in the book how you get together with your friends on a regular basis. You have time on your calendar, you know, hell or high water. We are going to meet same time, same place. Just put it in the book. Right. So like just put it in your calendar so, you know, you will see the people who are most important to you uh, on a regular basis. So, again, it's about turning your values into time. Don't just talk about, you know, if you ask most people what's important to you. Oh, my family, my friends, my health. OK, where is that time on your calendar? If it's not on your calendar, it's not reflecting your values. Yeah, yeah I think you got to remember it's like, like nothing happens just automatically. Like you have right. to make things happen for yourself. Sorry, Zarak, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I, I've seen also like. There is – it sort of snowballs a little bit in, in social groups anyways. Like I've had um, – so, so, I, so I moved to St. Louis last year and I didn't know anybody when I moved here. But, um, you know, pretty quickly was meeting people and making friends and because I was very intentional about like I'm going to spend a lot of time meeting people and making friends. Um, and – uh, had ended up with like a. You're also regular... just such a personable guy, Zarox. Oh, I mean, he is. <laughs> yeah, if, if you don't, if you don't follow Zarox's Instagram account, you, like this, this man lives the best life. Like, <laughs> it, he is gallivanting, gallivanting to castles in Croatia, to vineyards, and I mean, he's it's, everywhere. It's inspiring, he has really. The best yeah. Friends in the world. <laughs> so how do you? Yeah, keep going. How do you do it? Well, so so no, so I was gonna say, you know. Um, so I, you know, I, I ended up with um, first you kind of meet a lot of people, and then you kind of sort of sh it ends up sort of naturally shrinking down to a smaller group that you become closer with. And um, I had a, a regular Sunday night dinner, we call it like family dinner, with um, some friends of mine. And whenever I talk to um, you know new friends, and I tell them like, oh, I have this time set aside, and like you know we have like family dinner, they're like, like can I? Yeah. Can I that like can i kind of like of course you know um people do seem very it's it's interesting like I'll, the disconnect that i've seen and i think there was some research that came out this year about this like the disconnect between um people's sort of stated preference of like i want this connection um and like the steps that you take to to, to make that connection um because i'll sometimes be very forward in terms of just being like i'll meet someone that i think is really nice or friendly or interesting and instead of kind of being like coy of like oh like i'll friend them on facebook later or whatever mm. i'll just pretty much directly say like hey this was a lot of fun like do you want to be friends and get together sometime this week yeah. and just actually saying it like specifically like hey i think we should be friends <laughs> somehow that can you and i be friends <laughs> no this is yeah. You have a skill here. I mean, this is this is a practice that I think we all need to emulate of, you know, whether it's a, a Sunday dinner like you do, whether it's a Shabbat dinner, whether it's a beer night, you know, at a bar somewhere. But, you know, having a time on your schedule to reconnect with important people in your life, it is important and it will not happen organically as it doesn't happen with our kids and with our significant others. Right. Like my wife and I have date nights on our calendar. I have play dates with my daughter. Because we know work is just going to fill that time, <laughs> right? Like, if I don't make that time, somebody else is going to plan it for me. Yeah. Um, so I know we're getting a little later on time here, so I want to shift the last couple questions. Um, so kind of going back and thinking about from the behavioral design perspective. Um, so a lot of the book uh, is really about, like, individual empowerment. Like, how do we take our time back, take our attention back? Um, in an intentional way, regardless of what things or tools or technologies are out there distracting us, you know, as individuals, there's kind of timeless things that we can do. Um, kind of flipping that a little bit, you know, a lot of the people that listen to the podcast are in kind of this behavioral space and are probably working on products um, that in some sort of way are taking people's attention. Um, and like the examples we've talked about before, like with the pedometer example, like even good intentions can go awry within a product sometimes. So in kind of flipping this and thinking about there's, there's kind of the one side where we as individuals got to, you know, make ourselves indistractable as behavioral designers and those working on products and solutions to like problems that people have in their lives. How do we kind of better balance um, 
the sort of things that might be, let's say in the hooked model, for example, of how do we, you know, people come to us with a problem, we have this product that gives them a solution. Um, you know, how can we effectively try to balance that in helping them solve their problem, but also not make, you know, trying to not push people too far and even how do we even track that to make sure that we are getting into that example and going from there because you know, like I said it's not necessarily the technology's fault but we do have responsibilities people building products to try to make that better too right right so we, one we need to accept that we will make uh, unfortunately the, the the price of progress is uh, unfortunate byproducts that you know Paul Virilio said that when you invent the ship you invent the shipwreck. Uh, before that, Sophocles says, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. And there is, of course, an uh, unintended consequence to any technological innovation that's on the scale of the Internet or the Industrial Revolution uh, or the Green Revolution. Right? These things have unfortunate side effects. The, the, the answer, though, is to not you know, wish we could dial back the, the hands of time. The answer is more technology. Right to fix the bad aspects of one generation of technology. Uh, I mean, this is what we've done with the industrial revolution, with uh, with, with all sorts of you know. Every time that there's a, dis- uh, a, a, um, a some kind of technological revolution, there's always these side effects that we need to take care of. So there's a lot we can do. You know, one is to take care of vulnerable communities. So if we, you know, one thing I've advocated for, and I think the, some of the legislation I, I really do support, uh, is to uh, help people who are pathologically addicted. Right, that if someone uh, is overusing a product, and there's something that, that there's a very easy thing that we can do, we can, we know how much people are using a particular product, so it behooves us to to look for these people who are really using a product to an outsized extent. We can reach out to them and say, hey, you're using this product to an extent that may indicate you're struggling with an addiction. Can we help? So this is part of what I call a use and abuse policy. Again, this isn't everyone. This is a small part of the population that struggles with an addiction. Uh, and we can do that. And again, this isn't a problem that most uh, companies face, right? No SaaS software would have this problem. Uh, but sure, if you're in the gaming industry or a social media company or some kind of entertainment company, yeah, you might have people who unfortunately overuse your product to an extent where it might be causing them harm. And then there's a few other things we can do. Um, one thing that I put in Hooked uh, way back five years ago is this manipulation matrix that we as individuals need to ask ourselves two questions if we want to use behavioral design ethically. And this isn't about uh, you know uh, something that you use to judge other people or that other people use to judge you. This is simply a way of asking yourself if what you're working on is worth your human capital. And so you have to ask yourself these two questions. Number one, is what I'm working on materially improving people's lives? Okay, and that's a question that only you can answer by looking in the mirror is what I'm working on materially improving people's lives. The second question, that's not a good enough, though. The second question is, am I the user? Am I the user? Why do I want you to ask that question? Because I want you to break the first rule of drug dealing. Okay, what, what's the first rule of drug dealing? Zarak, I know you know the first rule of drug dealing. You never use your own product. There you go. Never get high, on your, high on your own supply. Your own supply. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to intentionally break that rule. Why? Because if there are any deleterious effects to using your product, you'll be the first to know about it. And so if you qualify in that category of people who are the users of the product and you believe you materially improve people's lives, you have the green light. Go for it. I think that's a good ethical place to be. It's a good ethical imperative. It's also a great business imperative, right? Because the hardest part about designing product is knowing what the hell the user wants. And so that's an amazing hack if you are yourself the user. And so you're what I call a facilitator, if you can answer in the affirmative to both of those questions. So that's one test, what I call the manipulation matrix, and that's that's been hooked since day one. And then uh, a few years ago, I developed this new um, test. And this test tried to answer this question of what do we do in groups? Okay, we can understand what we do individually, but what happens when you're in a product design meeting and somebody wants to use a dark pattern that you're not comfortable with? What do you do? And so I looked for some kind of test, some kind of ethical guide, and I I wasn't really satisfied with what was out there. I wanted something that a designer could raise their hand and say, hey, boss, I'm not so sure about this. And then the boss says, why? Well, because it doesn't such and such and such and such. So the first thing I found was Google's don't be evil. 
But I don't really like don't be evil. I mean, I don't even think Google uses don't be evil anymore. It used to be their motto. I don't think it actually is their motto anymore. Uh, but don't be evil doesn't work because it's completely subjective, right? What What is evil, right? What's evil to you might not be evil to someone else. So I'm not a big fan of don't be evil. So then I came across uh, what the ethicist told me was the golden rule, right? So do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The problem with the golden rule is that it puts the the, the judgment call of what should be done to the user in the hands of of the maker. And who says that the maker should decide? So the, the that doesn't work either, right? It shouldn't be the golden rule. It shouldn't be do unto others as you want them to do unto you. It should be do unto others as they want done to them. And so then I came across uh, what the lawyers said was the ethical test. The lawyers say, cover your ass, right? The lawyers say, just put it in the terms of service and just disclose, tell the users everything, right? And now you see a lot of people also in the in the tech space saying, well, we'll, we'll just disclose, 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 and that's it. Like, t- tell them every behavioral design technique we, tr- we, we might use, and that'll be it, which is ridiculous because we know nobody reads those terms of service, <laughs> right? Those agreements never get read. And so that's not, I don't think that's a good faith effort. I think that's pretty duplicitous to, to just say, we'll stuff it in the terms of service agreement, and that's enough. It's not enough. So what I came up with was the regret test. And the regret test says that when there is a questionable behavioral design tactic, someone raises their hand in the room and say and says, this sounds interesting, but I think we should run a regret test. And a regret test uses the same methodology that we in the design community have been using forever uh, of doing user testing. So user testing involves bringing a user or many users into a room, showing them the product experience and testing the usability of that experience. We've been doing this forever. This time with a regret test, instead of you know seeing how usable the experience is, instead we come in or we, we bring people in, a representative sample of our future users, and we ask them to walk through the user experience, but then we ask them, knowing everything that you now know, right, would you do what you did? Meaning, if the user knew everything that you as the designer knows, would they still do what they did? And we have to disclose to them exactly what happened. So if there are any uh, uh, coercive tactics, you'll know about it. Remember, there's, there's two types of behavioral design. There is persuasion and coercion. Persuasion is helping people do what they want to do. Coercion is getting people to do things they don't want to do. And the difference between persuasion and coercion is one word, regret. You regret things that you were coerced to do. So the test is, knowing everything the designer knows, would you do what you just did? And then we measure that, right? So how many people say, yeah, I would totally do that. That's good. I'm happy with that. I don't regret that at all. Is that 50%, 70%, 9 out of 10? Like how many people said that they would do that behavior, that they don't regret that behavior? And so we just need some bar. I suggest 9 9 out of 10. The good news about this regret test is, that most times you don't even need to run one. That simply raising your hand and saying, hey boss, I think we should run this regret test. I'm not so sure about this. Nine times out of 10 is going to uh, negate the need to even run the test in the first place because it gets people thinking of, hmm, I wonder if people would would regret this because remember, nobody wants users to regret their product, right? Facebook doesn't want you to overuse and burn out. Right? They are dealing with the repercussions of that problem right now. There's been data that shows that 30% of users in the UK uh, all of a sudden left Facebook because they regret using the product. This is a huge problem for them. They don't want that. And they're, believe me, I can tell you from the inside, they've told me what they're doing. They are running around like crazy to try and figure out ways to make their products less engaging because they don't want people to burn out. None of these tech companies want you to get addicted. That's ridiculous. Because what do people do when they get addicted to something? They they eventually burn out. That's what most people do, right? If they don't die from a a dangerous drug, eventually the number one program for recovery is to age out, to simply not need it anymore when your life circumstances change and you realize that this product is harming you. And so they don't want you to use it for a little while intensely. They want you to use the product for the rest of your life in a healthy manner, in a sustainable fashion. So we constantly contest regret to make sure that our, our users uh, don't regret using our product and service. So that becomes our, our test for the ethical use of these products. We can run a regret test well before we implement the product to make sure that we're not doing anything potentially that could get us in trouble ethically or from a business standpoint uh, now. R- remember, you know, we want to know about that now because this day and age, if people don't like your product, not only did they stop using your product, 
they're going to tell all their friends to stop using your product. So we want to we want to assess regret as soon as possible before the user interacts with our product or service. Yeah, so but do regret tests as a behavior designer, but don't assume every product you use is using regret tests, so become indistractable <laughs> as a defense for that. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> awesome. So I think uh, we're about our time here. Um, so I wanted to say um, any kind of last thoughts um, you'd like to share with the audience? Um, no, that's you guys have covered it. You asked some, some great questions. It was a real pleasure. I hope there was some value here for, for everyone. <laughs> Great. So before we sign off here, just let uh, people know uh, how can they uh, find your work, how can they find the book, um, and how can they keep track of your work going forward? Sure. So my blog is at near and far. Near is spelled like my first name, N-I-R, so nearandfar.com. And uh, for more information about my books, my first book is called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. My next book is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And if you go to indistractable.com, there are all kinds of free tools and resources that you can get there, like a schedule maker that doesn't you know, totally free. You don't even have to give an email. You can start using that immediately. Uh, there's an 80-page workbook. Uh, there are videos, all kinds of resources at indistractable.com. And that's I-N, distract, A-B-L-E. So indistractable.com. Awesome. So yeah, I highly recommend. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the book. It was very timely for me, I would say. Um, I've definitely been uh, feeling a little more distracted recently myself. So um, I think it's a really, really timely book, both for me and I think for everyone in kind of our new technology age here. So thank you for writing it and hopefully people check it out. And thank you so much for joining us here. This is really fun. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. That concludes this edition of Action Design Radio, hosted by Eric Johnson and Zarak Khan. All podcast episodes are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and many other platforms where you might typically get your pod on. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Special thanks to Morgan Bortz for design. And as always, we would like to recognize Steve Wendell, founder of the Action Design Network, a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading awareness about behavioral economics, psychology, and all things behavioral science in order to help you improve your life, your career, and your understanding of the world around us and the people in it. I am your producer and audio engineer, Zach Simon. For more cutting-edge behavioral science content, visit action-design.org. Once again, that's action-design.org. There, you can sign up for our newsletter and find an in-person event happening near you. We have chapters in over a dozen cities in the United States and Canada. Also, on our website, you can find additional notes and links regarding the topics discussed in today's episode. Thank you again for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.